Gay Nation, Gabe. Nick. And we are here today to bring you another cricket reaction. And yes, a little bias. If, if you like, listen, let's be honest, all right? I'm going to put the content out there. I want the content I love. I'd love to put some more West Indies stuff out there. But they got to give me something to smile about. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. What? The field is very unfruitful. Am I asking for too much? Am I asking for too much? But in the last two years, we have seen some incredible matches, Nick. And I still contend that the most incredible match I saw was that uh, in the Ashes, actually the one game that Australia, and I root for Australia, didn't win. It was just such a feat to see that Jimmy Anderson and Stuart Broad at the end oh, would not go it, yeah. down. And I mean, you've even got Smudge, you know, a spin, as a spin out the other side, just trying to get the wicket. I he actually got the wicket before uh, uh, Jimmy Anderson. Uh, no, or yeah, G before Jimmy Anderson came on, because Stuart Broad was already on. Yeah. Stuart Broad actually saw quite a few deliveries. It wasn't like only an over. I think I think Jimmy like Anderson 20 or 25 balls, yeah. saw one over where Stuart Broad saw quite a, 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 a few deliveries. But to me, that, that, that to me was like, I never understood... Like, I was like, what, what's the difference between a draw and, and, and a tie? You know what I mean? Like, I, I never understood. And people are like, it could be some of the most exciting cricket you ever seen. To me, that was some of the most exciting cricket I ever seen. That game was so memorable. It was nail-biting. But in that series, series, we also had other things that happened, other players that emerged. And Scotty Bolin has been one of the revelations, right, for yeah. uh, Australia. And... We did the, the the Ashes, not the Ashes, but, well, basically the Test Season 2, which talked about the Ashes and talked about Scotty Bolin and his importance, right, of him being Aborigine. Is it Aborigines? Aborigine. Right? Uh, um, one of the very few to ever be. I think there was, like, he was one of two or three ever to be on the Australian cricket team or something like that. Correct us in the, in, in, in the chat if I'm getting correct. And I think someone also to correct us and let us know that it's, it's somewhat offensive to some people to say that term. So we'll just say native native okay okay well to be fair that's what they said in the video right, so right. Uh, i didn't realize that that was uh considered offensive but i think it's it's super cool because as a native he's able to reach out to other players and the reality is representation matters right one of the things i like to do nick and you know this working with me whenever i have a chance and i haven't been able to do it since the pandemic because of rules you know can't bring people in but i've bought in savannah's nephew before i video chatted my classes with him before because he's still, as a pro athlete, able to talk to these kids. And they see, hey, he's a person like anyone else. You know what I mean? Like, when they can make that connection, like, oh, yeah, he grew up going to school like you guys. You know, uh, uh, getting in trouble in class just like you guys. Not doing your assignments just like you guys. It's it, it's represent to somebody that looks like them. Somebody that, 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 that sounds like them. Somebody that can share those experiences. It matters. Because now it's like, oh, wow, I can do it too. And I think that that's why it's so important when it comes to representation and cricket because now other natives can say oh wow you know what we can do this too and it right. opens up that door you can tap into that talent pool right um representation definitely matters but if we were to think about it as just like a you know just a sports lens wouldn't you want the best players in the world playing for your team <laughs> absolutely the, um so i got excited about as a chargers fan in american football is they just signed i didn't know about the international draft whatever they call that they just signed this kid uh, i think 20 years old from Africa, who played in this NFL Africa all-star game, if you will, and he was just, he's a defensive lineman, just trucking guys heavier and stronger than he was. Right. And so the Chargers straight out signed him. And <laughs> as a Chargers fan, we were looking for any kind of ray of hope. Anything. We are pumped up about this because right. if this guy were, that's, I didn't know the scouts went out to Africa, I think it's from Nigeria. Right. If you can play, you can play for crying out loud. And let's bring you over. Antonio Gates, another former Charger. He wasn't from Africa, he's an American. But this guy went to college as a basketball, basketball player, player right? didn't play one snap in, as football, yeah. decided to try as an unrestricted free agent, made the team. He's going to go to the Hall of Fame. for right. If you can play, you can play, for right. crying out loud. Athletes are athletes, man. This and better. when you need the talent, let's get it. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and check out this video from Six and Out. Right. It's, it's called How Scott Bullen Really Is That Good. This video on this channel, it's a relatively new channel, just blew up for the guys, so we're super excited about that. But I'm excited to revisit this. And he did the videos for the basketball that we reacted to. Go ahead and check those out about the risks and about the benefits of it. Likes his style. So I want to check out this video of his to learn a little more about it. Hope I can get some goosebumps because it's an amazing story. If you don't know anything about it, sit back and relax. You're going to enjoy this. If you like our reaction to this in any way, please don't forget to 
like and subscribe. And I just think I just thought about it. You're right. I think it was like five off six, so like that. So just say. I think it's at seven. least six wickets. It might not have been seven. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with six, if I had to bet. You sticking right. with five, or you going to six two? I think it was five off seven, or something like that. Oh, five tests. The runs were so small. Yeah, you're right. Twenty five wickets. Wow. And it was twenty seventh like of December, twenty twenty one, Melbourne, Australia. Man, it's day two of the third Ashes Test between Australia and England, held in the iconic Melbourne Cricket Ground. After being bowled out for 185 in the first innings, England came out to bat for a second time hoping to surpass Australia's score of 267. But what would happen in that innings would become the stuff of oh, legend. Bowling. With fading light, a raucous local crowd and only 10 minutes left until the end of day's play, England were already 2 for 22 down and Aussie captain Pat Cummins throws the ball to local boy Scott Bowling. The rest is history. Ball 1, left alone. Ball 2, left alone. Ball 3. Oh. Ball four, defended. Oh, just. Ball five. Yeah, look at that Corden behind him. Oh, oh that was on the lead too. Wow. What the am I going to say? Oh, big hate the lead. Crashing down. Ball sounds. six, glance to the leg side. England finish at stumps with four for 31. The following day, Boland would come back out and get wickets three, four, five, five, and six. Oh, you're right. Six. Six off seven, actually. I hate you. Leaving with bowling figures of six for seven and helping six Australia seven. to retain the ashes at home. What? Since this series, some people have wondered whether Scott Boland's performances were a flash in the pan or if Scott Boland can continue these performances <laughs> for fan. years to we come. Maybe even away from home. In this video, we analyze what makes Scott Boland such a tough oh, bowler. I like that. I didn't know it was going to be like Why that. it has taken so long for him to break into the Australian side, and if he has a long-term place in Australia's first 11. By the end of it, you will know why Scott Boland really is that good. Before we move on, just a quick thanks to you for checking out this video. You're if you enjoy it or any other video on this channel, please be sure to leave a like or even consider subscribing. Make sure to hit that bell notification too so that you don't miss any more Six and Out content which is on the way. With that being said, let's get moving. What makes Scott Boland such a good bowler? There are many different ways that fast bowlers have gotten their wickets throughout history. Some have expressed pace and intimidate bowlers into mistakes, while others rely on swing or even changes of pace to earn their success. Scott does not bowl express pace or have crazy swing, but what he does use is perhaps the oldest method of all, accuracy. Scott has the ability to put the ball on a specific line and length, ball after ball after ball. Ping ball? This has led to some commentators comparing him to one of those bowling machines that gets used during <laughs> practice sessions. But some of you might be wondering, well if he bowls at the same place over and over again, doesn't that mean batters will know where the ball is going and by extension it will be easier for them to hit it? Well, it's not that simple. You see, <coughs> Bolin often pitches the ball back of a length around fourth stump line outside off. In plain terms, that means it's around here to the right hander and when it gets to the batter, the ball ends up very close to the line of the batter's off stump which means they feel that they can't leave it because it looks like it might hit the wickets if they do. Yep, can't leave it. It is known as the doorway to departure or <laughs> the avenue of apprehension or, well, you get the point. It's not that fun. He has the ability to pitch ball after ball in an area the size of a napkin, which means <laughs> batters are always under pressure. That the is second disgusting. part of this is that That's he is crazy. a seam bowler by trade, meaning that he bowls the ball in such a way that the seam of the cricket ball will make contact with the pitch and bounce off in different directions from ball to ball. This natural variation in where the ball goes adds even more uncertainty to the batter's mind. One might go straight, the next left, and the next right. It means that batters are put in an uncomfortable position oh, and not really being able to totally trust their own judgment <laughs> on which balls to hit and which to leave. The final kicker to all of this is, Boland is a workhorse of a fast bowler, forged on the often lifeless and batter-friendly pitches of the MCG <laughs> during the mid to late 2010s. Playing for the built. Victorian stateside, Boland was relied upon to bowl a significant amount of overs for his team's fortunes, including the three-peat title-winning sides from 2014-15 to 2016-2017. As you can see on this table, if you go into the 2017-2018 and 2018-2019 seasons, Boland also bowled the most overs for his entire Jeez. team in those seasons, including bowling the... 10 matches. 
367 overs wow. for a fast bowler. 38 wickets. They obviously don't have that. I mean, it's supposed to be test matches. They don't have those <laughs> 10 over minimums. They have any ODI. 48 wickets in 2019. That's Look disgusting. The economies. That is disgusting. Wow. I just had to stop for a second. That's crazy. The most overs of any bowler in the competition during 2018-2019. He was also the third highest wicket taker for both of those seasons. These three qualities, his accuracy, his seam bowling and his endurance make Scott Boland the quality bowler that he is today, regardless of if the conditions suit him or not. With all this talk of how good he is, you might be wondering, <laughs> then why did it take so long for him to get a call up to the test side? Well, from the outside, it's really a difficult thing to know for sure, but I think there is one central factor in all of this, and that's competition. <laughs> Australia is one of the yeah, most competitive places in the world to become an international fast bowler. Yeah. Not only do the conditions suit fast bowlers, but the folklore and history of Australian cricket means that there are no shortage of people who want to become the next Brett Lee, Glenn McGrath or Pat Cummins. Not only do you have to be good to get into the side, the stars have to kind of align a little bit. Someone needs to be injured or going through some poor performances to be replaced. Scott Boland's most successful domestic seasons prior to his international debut were in 2015-16, 2017-18 and 2018-19. In 2015-16, there was no opening with Josh Hazelwood and his Victorian teammates James Pattinson and Peter Siddle in the side. Or from 2017 onwards, saw the beginning of the current Australian bowling attack. Cummins, Stark, Hazelwood, and Lyon. The stars just never really aligned until 2021, where not only was he in form, but COVID and injuries affected the team. Stark, Cummins, and first replacement Jai Richardson were all facing time on the sidelines giving him the opportunity for his first baggy green. Now that he's in the side, how long can he really stay there? Well, with these performances, Scott has proven that at the very least, he deserves to be in the wider Australian test squad moving forward. The problem is, is that he is stuck behind one of Australia's best ever bowling lineups, yep. each of them taking over 200 test wickets each. <coughs> Moreover, Scott disgusting. Boland isn't the only bowler knocking down the door at the moment. Jai Richardson, and Michael Neesa have also recently taken their opportunities in the test side with both hands. Not to mention Lance Morris and Mark Steckity topping this year's Sheffield Shield wicket-taking list. It's an embarrassment it goes back to what we said earlier. Uh, Being sure. an Australian fast bowler is very competitive, and at the age of 33, it means that he has a smaller window than some of the other candidates. If you have any thoughts on who you would prefer, let me know in the comment section below. To end this, I want to put my Australian fan cap on for a second and give you an Aussie fan perspective of Scott Boland. Scott Boland is the type of person I love to have in the Australian side. Sure, he doesn't have express pace or swing the ball around corners, but I know that whether it's the Boxing Day test or day four of an almost meaningless test elsewhere, he will continue to charge in and be a constant thorn in the side of batters who hate to face his style of bowling. His inclusion in the side came after almost a decade of working hard in the domestic Sheffield Shield system, with some of those years being successful on arguably the worst first class pitch in the country. Furthermore, his public image as a quiet, humble man who shies away from publicity is a breath of fresh air in a cricket era headlined by big money mm -hmm. and celebrity worship. He is a credit to his Indigenous Australian heritage Indigenous. and an example yeah, yeah. for all Australians to follow. For as long as he remains in the side, that is why Aussies will continue to chant his name in the crowd. That's why Aussie commentators go crazy when he gets a wicket. And that's why he really is that good. Love it. Video by a fan. Video by a guy that does research, a guy that puts some stuff together. He's not just saying, I'd, like some I would do, I just think he's awesome. Chris Wilkes, right? <laughs> but uh, I, I enjoyed that video a lot. The the impressive thing is, yes, he's got a mild manner temp, or a, you know temperament, if you will. So that's very, very helpful. But if I'm Scott Bowen, right, not that he would do this, and they're wondering, like, do we put Jai in there? Do we put Nestor in there? Do we put this? maybe these two young kids from Shed, whatever we do? What do we do? And he's like, can I just say one thing? Do any of those guys have six and seven <laughs> at the MCG? In the ashes? It's, I don't think so. It's, I'm telling you, dude. I'll wait, I'll wait your call. He's so humble because I think I would, to my detriment, I would be losing my mind. To my detriment, I would be losing my mind. Now, here's the reality, dude. No. <clears throat> here's the reality. In sports, I, I just don't think, and I mean, I've seen it from firsthand where you know whether it's you know savannah's nephew you know who again pr plays uh pro football or soccer um to even at the collegiate level when savannah's br brother was a captain of soccer team at unlv training like 
the higher up you go, Nick, everyone can play. Every single one can play. Guys don't drop catches, especially during warm up and and, and um in football. You know what I mean? They make one handed catches all the time. They make it look easy. If you've ever been to an NBA game, you'll see that these guys hit these shots like it's nothing. All the time. Eyes closed. Like and you're like, what's going on? they're so uber talented. So you're always facing the best of be the, the best of the best. And the one thing we call it luck. He said the stars has to align, but for the most part, you have to have a little bit of luck. Luck to stay healthy because usually that's what opens the door for somebody else when you can't stay healthy and for you to be healthy when that door opens up. You, you got to have a little bit of luck because if it's just based on pure athletic ability, it's Australia and it's the, the test team. It's, it's not like they've got multiple teams. It's a they've got right now. Th there's so many good players. Same thing like India. We said India can literally field two test teams. No problem. That that's how much guys have not had a chance to get out there because there's so many good athletes out there, and that's how it is, man. The higher you go up in a level, uh, uh, from you know high school to collegiate, collegiate to pro, there's everybody can play, man. So I feel bad for bowling because at 33, I mean this is true of pretty much all sports. You're in the twilight of your career. You know most athletes, 35 is after 35 you start on the downward trajectory. It that's why when you look at Jimmy Anderson at 40, what he's doing, you're like, oh my gosh, you know what I mean? But 35. I mean, 33, he's got maybe three more years to make a, a big impact. And then he's definitely not going to be selected at that point because Australia got so many people, like you said, beating on the door. He's got a year or two tops uh, to continue to add to his legacy, which is sad, but at least he got to add the legacy. You know how many Scotty exactly. Bolins, not necessarily Scotty Bolins, but how many guys... Never how many of his teammates, teammates on his, uh, I'm not sure if it's the, the cricket club, I'm not sure what level it was. The championship. How many of those guys are never going to get a chance? And it's yeah. not that Scott Bowen cares about the fame of this, he probably doesn't. Right. But you would never be able to take the performance away from him, right. right? He's now on their radar. Things happen for a reason, all right? We've seen Hazel would struggle with some injuries the last 12 months or so. Right. Things happen for a reason. And if it's your time to help out, all I know is this. Whenever they play the MCG, if they don't have Scott Bowen, they're going to lose their... I'm going to lose my mind. Build that man a statue! I That's mean, my favorite that line. Should, he <laughs> should have a spot regardless. Even if they're like, who wants to take a day off? Because, oh, we got Bowen? I'll take a day off. I'm good. Let us know what your thoughts are about Scott Bowen, about the wonderful spell he had, and about his chances of getting into the, the, the cricket side a little more frequently. We saw him there in India for one or two of the matches, so that was nice. Let us know what you think. Comment below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And until next time. That's six runs.